Let's finish off this chapter today, Genesis chapter 25. The previous chapters, we did have a lot of fun. We did have a lot of fun. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 25. We left off at uh, Keturah's family, and she is uh, part. She is part of the reason why the uh, Arabic people were able to gain their tribes and their people. We're now at verse nine. Verse nine. Recall that Abraham he passed away and he died. So then now he's going to get buried. I'm going to explain each and every word in the verse that you're reading because this is literally word by word, verse by verse Bible study. It's so that you can understand every word in your Bible and get a blessing. All right, let's look at verse 9. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. That's self-explanatory. Abraham's two sons are named Isaac and Ishmael. They buried Abraham in a cave at the location of Machpelah. Recall that Abraham bought this cave originally for his wife, Sarah, when she passed away. So Abraham is going to be buried in the same cave. In the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. So the cave of Machpelah is located in Ephron's field. Now Ephron, he is the son of Zohar the Hittite. Remember that the Hittite people were the ones who played a part with helping Abraham bury his wife Sarah at the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre. And that's uh, before the presence in front of Mamre. Remember, Mamre is the place of Abraham's homeland. That's his original homeland. So because Mamre was close by, the cave of Machpelah, stands to reason why Abraham would buy that cave. We're going to look at verse 10, the field which, a which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried. That's self-explanatory, like I told you before, it's that same field from Ephron that Abraham uh, bought from the sons of Heth. Those were the group of people that Abraham met and dealt with. And then Ephron, the son of Zoar, the Hittite, was one of those Within the, son, uh, within the sons of Heth, who helped Abraham with the purchase. And Abraham was buried right there at that field. And Sarah, his wife. So Sarah, his wife, and Abraham were buried over in that field. Verse 11, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham. <clears throat> so sometime what happened after Abraham died, that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi. So after Abraham died, that's when God started to really bless Isaac. Because remember, Abraham was the one who received the blessing from God. Now that he died and passed away, the Lord has to pass it down to his son Isaac. So Isaac receives and inherits that blessing from Abraham. So God starts to really bless uh, Isaac, his, uh, his son, Abraham's son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi, if you might recall. The well Lahiroi, I explained, that's where Hagar uh, had her encounter with God. And this was located around Beersheba. They would say usually from Dan to Beersheba. What Dan to Beersheba would refer to is the north to the southernmost part of Israel. So it's somewhere around here. If we were to say that it's somewhere around here, that Isaac is located, and remember that Abraham was at Mamre, and that's somewhere close by where Isaac is. And remember, Ishmael was sent away. He was pushed away from Abraham's territory, Isaac's territory. That would leave him toward this terrain or this terrain. That's the reason why a lot of the Arabic people, you'll notice, and the people who are adherents of Islam, they're around this territory or around this territory. So they're being sent around that way. And the rest of the passage is going to explain that. Ishmael, verse 12. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son. 
So it's going to now explain to you the generations of Ishmael's descendants, the list of his sons. Ishmael is Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. Ishmael uh, was uh, born from Hagar the Egyptian. She was the one that gave birth, brought him forth into this world. She was the one that bore Ishmael to Abraham, and she is Sarah's handmaid. So remember during that time, during the ancient timelines, it didn't matter if it was Jew or whatever culture, slavery was very common that time. So Hagar was Sarah's uh, slave. We're going to look at verse 13, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. So now the verse is going to give the list of these names from Ishmael's sons, and it's going to go by their names, and their generations will follow accordingly from these names. So here are their names, and I've written them out for you over here. And I'm also going to give you the definition of their names from Dr. Upman's uh, Genesis commentary. So according to his Genesis commentary, here are the following definitions for each of Ishmael's son's name. The first one is, notice right here, and he's the firstborn, the uh, eldest from Ishmael's line, Nebajoth, or Nebehoth, I'm not sure, but probably Nebajoth. And Nebajoth, uh, basically, his name means heights, heights. There are people located in northern Arabia, so that would explain why heights can match up with that name. The next name is Kedar, Kedar. Kedar means black skin. Kedar means black skin. These are dwellers also of northern Arabia. And they're actually referred to many times in the Bible, Kedar. You're going to find that quite often. Next person is Abdil. Abdil. His name means miracle of God. Miracle of God. Uh, not much uh, detail, except that they are an Arabian tribe. Let's see here. The other one is Mibsam. Mibsam. His name means sweet odor. His name sweet, uh, means sweet order. odor. Excuse me. <laughs> so we don't know much about him. Another one is Mishma. Mishma. His name means hearing. Hearing. He's a tribe that's located northeast of Medina. A tribe that's located northeast of Medina. The next one is Duma, Duma. His name means silence, silence, quite the opposite of Mishma. Perhaps uh, Ishmael didn't like Mishma. He was a big mouth, so then he decided to name his boy Silence. <laughs> He's, uh, now, Duma is actually a town in northern Arabia on the edge of the Syrian desert. It's on the edge of the Syrian desert. So remember, Syria is next to Israel and northern Arabia. Notice that Ishmael is pushed like around this territory. You notice that? So he's like around this territory here. If we're going to keep reading down, Masa, Masa or Massa, either or. And Massa means burden. Massa means burden. I hope that's not a bad omen. We have Vince Massa preaching at our blowout. Hopefully he will not be a burden. Amen? Okay. Uh, the next one is Hadar. Hadar. His name means chamber. Chamber. And that's actually a tried, uh, lo tribe located in Yemen, believe it or not. It's a tribe located in Yemen. Now, there's a website, and I have to uh, pull it up real quickly, that actually gave a lot of interesting details on Ishmael's descendants. Now, the website is not doctrinally right, but the person has a very big infatuation with the tribes of Ishmael that he dug up their names and then their root words. So, as you look up these names, what I would encourage you is to look it up yourselves, and to make sure if each name would match up. 
Now, this is how he described uh, all of Ishmael's sons. First of all, if we're going to go to Nabajoth, he says this, that more information is known about Ishmael's eldest son, Nabajoth, than any others. He claims that in the Bible, Kedar, Q-E-D-A-R, uh, and the tribe of Nabayot, so that's the name of that tribe, Nabayot, they were renowned for sheep raising, and that can be found in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 7. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 7. Now, their names are frequently found, believe it or not, in the Assyrian records. You notice what's nearby that area where uh, Ishmael's descendants are being pushed? Right here. So Assyria would obviously keep record of them because Ishmael's descendants were pushed along that terrain. Now, the writer claims that Nabajoth is specifically mentioned by Josephus. Now, if you look up Josephus' writing, he's a Jewish first century historian. And he pulls up a lot of interesting information and covers some historical parts where the Bible does not cover. Uh, they are known as the Nabataeans, Nabataeans during his time with Ishmael's sons. And he claimed that the Nabataeans lived through the whole country extending from the Euphrates River to the Red Sea. And they referred to that area as Nabatine. Josephus claims that the Nabataeans conferred their names on the Arabian nations. And that can be found in his work, Jewish Antiquities, 1.22 and also at 1.22. Uh, point one. Josephus lived and wrote when the Nabataeans were in existence at that time. Supposedly, Josephus got his information from the Nabataeans directly. They wrote an early form of Arabic and were often referred to as Arabs. So if you go through Nabajoth's line, that's where the word Arab would mostly refer to from Ishmael's eldest descendant. King Ashurbanipal supposedly was fighting with the Nabataeans of Arabia. Now remember, they were in northern Arabia. So the Assyrians colliding with them would be very reasonable. Then a group of Chaldeans, then neighboring tribes, they rebelled against Sennacherib, the Assyrian ruler, then Tiglath-Pileser III, his, the ancient records from him, would also mention about the, let's see, it says right here, list among the rebels, the uh, Hagoranu, who are possibly the descendants of Hagar and the mother of Ishmael, the Nabatu, very possibly the descendants of Nabayoth, which is the uh, eldest of, son of Ishmael, or Nabajoth, and the Kedarites, who are descendants of Ishmael's second son. According to the records, the tribes fled from Assyria into the Arabian desert and could not be conquered. That's the reason why a lot of them fell over here, the Ishmaelites. The reason why they ended up in there is because of that Assyrian empire. Notice that it's getting cramped there, right? So then because it's getting cramped there, there's no more room, so they have to go south right here. A lot of this would make uh, sense, but again, you have to clarify and make sure. I don't believe every word. Some of them could be off. Well, let's see. He has a lot recorded here about uh, the Nabajoth. But if people are interested, the website is titled The Twelve Tribes of Ishmael, and it's just a simple blog. Uh, I can't say that the guy is a scholar himself, but he did do a lot of research and pulled up and did up, dig up a lot of quotes. The website is Nabatea. So you can see right here, he already has a deep interest in the descendants of Ishmael. N-A-B-A-T-A-E-A. -A -A -E -A. Again, N-A-B-A-T-A-E-A -A -A -E -A dot net, dot net. All right, I'm gonna skip down because I don't have much time. Uh, let's see here. Kedar are also known as the Kedarites. 
Uh, Isaiah speaks of Kedar's glory and her gifted archers in Isaiah chapter 21. Ezekiel 27 associates Arabia with all the princes of Kedar. Kedarites were always in conflict with the Assyrians, Neo-Babylonians, Persians. And even the Romans realized the importance of taking control of the commercial routes in northern Arabia that were under the dominion of the Kedarites. Now, Nehemiah's opponent was called Gishar, Gisham the Arabian. He's been identified as one of the kings of Kedar from the mid-5th century B.C. So he could be from the descendants of uh, Kedar himself, Ishmael's second son. Let's see here. Atar Semayin was known as the morning star of heaven, and that was one of their chief deities. It was a counterpart of the Mesopotamian Ishtar. Everything goes back, <coughs> excuse me, to Semiramis and Nimrod, you notice. Everything goes back there. Uh, Kedarites are mentioned in several passages. Uh, let's see here. Kedarites were the ones who seemed to fade away from history, and the Nabataeans were the ones who came more at the forefront. Now, Nabataeans are the ones that you want to research the most if you want to dig traces. Abdil, he's uh, identified with the land of Arubu. They were subjects of Tiglath Pileser II. Chieftain was called Idibi, uh, oof, Idibi Ilu. So Idibi Ilu, there we go. He operated as the Assyrian king's agent on the borders of Egypt. Now you'll notice right here that Ishmael's uh, borderline on verse 18 is like the borderline of Egypt, but we're going to cover that soon. And Shur is located there, and Egypt is right there. Okay, so uh, I didn't write Egypt. Let me write that. So Egypt would be around this area. Uh, oh my goodness, my, my brain is so foggy today. Okay, <laughs> I was going to write another G. Okay, I think that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is so foggy today. Anyways, Ishmael's line would cover so far here, and then we see here. And then I'm, when we hit verse 18, I'm going to really cover it. If I keep talking about Ishmael, I won't be able to get to this list right over here about Esau and Jacob. So let's get going on. His tribe was said to have dwelt far away towards the west. Some historians thought that the tribe of Abdeel lived in the Sinai, so where Mount Sinai was supposedly located. Mibsam and Mishma, let's cover both of them. The historians, some of them wondered if descendants of Mishma founded the villages around Jebel Mishma. They thought that these two tribes intermarried with the Simeonites, so the tribe of Simeon and then eventually disappeared from history as a separate entity. And the passage is 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 24 through 27. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 24 through 27. Duma, the next one, he's mentioned in biblical records as a city in Canaan itself. Joshua chapter 15, verse 52. It is associated, believe it or not, with Edom and Seir. In Isaiah chapter 21, verse 11. So Esau's descendants, you'll notice as, it, as generations pass by, with Ishmael's descendants, generations passing by, they intermarried in between. So then the Muslims and the Arabs that later came out, they are mingled with Esau's bloodline as well. They are mingled with Esau's bloodline, you're going to find out. Duma is generally identified with the Adirian Adumatu people. Esar Haddon's records would mention his father Sennacherib struck down Adumatu in an attempt to subdue the Arabs. Sennacherib, he did capture their king, whose name was Hazael, and he was known as king of the Arabs. Gazael is also referred to in one of the Assyrian inscriptions of Ashurbanipal as king of the Kedarites. 
So then the Kedarites may have intermingled with them. As I've taught you in intermediate discipleship, it's inevitable, no matter how the nations were scattered, they would eventually intermarry. Yep. So there's intermingling. It's inevitable. Intermingling is inevitable. Yep. Adamato is often associated with the medieval Arabic Dumat el Jandal. In ancient times, that was a very important strategic junction on the major trade route between Syria, Babylon, Najd, and Hijaz area. Now, if you recall, Joseph, when he was sold as a slave, Ishmaelites were merchants. So trade is a big thing amongst the Ishmaelites. So this route where they're located, you notice it's a rich route toward all major nations. The Ishmaelites had that terrain. Duma became the gatekeepers to North Arabia. That's how his location made the scenery to be. The oasis in the territory was the center of the rule for many North Arabian kings and queens. Now, a lot of this is recorded in the Assyrian records. So Assyria holds a lot of the records with Ishmael. But actually, Genesis chapter 25, verse 18, hinted that as well. It mentioned Assyria in there yeah. with Ishmaelites, uh, with the Ishmaelite territory. So you want to dig up the Assyrian records. Genesis 25, it's literally loaded right here. Anything that you want to dig up on the Arabic people. Let's see. Man, I do not have a lot. Uh, I don't have time to read all of this, but this is a he has a lot of stuff. Massa, in the Assyrian records, that it's the inhabitants of Ma Masa and Tima who pay Tiglath-Pileser the third tribute. 14 kilometers south of Tema, it's on the summit, a summit of Jebal Gunain, if I'm pronouncing that right. Let's see. The tribe of Massa may have been in connection with Dedan and Nabayat. They had a war against Dedan, uh, and a war against Nabayat, and a war against Massa, and these tribes appear to have been very close to each other at that time. Their Massa is possibly connected to the Masanoi of North Arabia, and this was mentioned by Ptolemy. Uh, let's see here. There's a theory about the children of Israel when they cross the Red Sea into Arabia, and there's a theory that identify El Masser as the place where the Israelites murmured and complained. And that can be found in Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, chapter 9, verse 22, and chapter 33, verse 8. Hey, Dad may have been known as the Harar or the Hararina people who lived near the mountains northwest of Palmyria. And believe it or not, there is a Hadad tribe in Arabia. Now, most of the Hadads, they actually been quote-unquote Christianized. So, believe it or not, when Christianity was spreading out during the early centuries, most of them had been Christianized. But as you might know, a lot of Orthodox Christianity is mingled with the Arabic culture and Catholicism as well. Some examples will include Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Modern-day Hadadin tribe can be re related to that. Now, Tima is associated usually with the ancient coast of Tema, and that's northeast of the Hijaz district, the trade route between Tathrib, which is Medina, and Duma. Between Tema and Duma is the famous Nafud Desert. It is thought that the present city of Tema at the southwestern end of the great Nafud Desert is built on the remains of the ancient oasis by the same name. Tiglath-Pileser III, as usual, received tributes from Tema, and they mentioned about a coalition headed by Samsi, queen of the Arabs, was defeated. They also mentioned a coalition was made up with Masa, the city of Tema, the tribes of Saba, Hajapa, Badana, Hati, and Idiba-il, uh, which lay far to the west. 
When they were defeated, they had to send tribute of gold, silver, camels, and spices of all kinds. As a matter of fact, the Assyrian king Sennacherib named one of his gates in the great city of Nineveh as the Desert Gate and records that the gifts of the Sumuanite and the Tamite enter through it. So the Assyrian gate in Nineveh may have been named after this group. Nabonidus, who was king of Babylon, father of biblical Belshazzar, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, made the city of Tama his residence, believe it or not, and spent 10 of the 16 years of his reign there. And that's why uh, Cyrus was able to conquer Babylon after that. He was taking a vacation. During the Achaemenid period, Tama probably became a seat of one of the Persian emperors, believe it or not. However, by the first century BC, the Nabataeans, remember the eldest son from Ishmael, began to dominate Tama, then it slowly became a part of the trading empire. Now, Isaiah chapter 21, verse 13 through 14, invites the people of Tama to provide water and food for their fugitive countrymen. And that may be an apparent allusion to uh, Tiglat Pileser's invasion of North Arabia at that time. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 23, is a prophecy against their oasis, their famous oasis city. Then Job chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Job laments his fall from wealth and comments that the troops from Tema and the armies of Sheba, which is Yemen, possibly, had hoped for plunder, but now Job had nothing. All right. The last three, Jeter, Naphish, and Kadima. Now, I dig up everything that I could on these three, and, believe, and there is nothing about these three. There is one about, I think, uh, one of these three. Let me look up real quickly. There is one record of one of these boys. Uh, I think it was Jeter, Jeter, and he had some interesting connection. Let's see here. Or was it... Uh, here's Ishmael's line. Oh, I lost it. Oh, no, here it is. Okay, it's Nafish. Nafish, okay. Nafish... And actually, it was, uh, believe it or not, in the King James Bible, it is uh, N-E, which we can see right here, N-E-P-H-I-S-H. So in the King James Bible, I think when they were updating spelling because of pronunciation, they may have had an E that time. And according to uh, that word in Hebrew, it can mean refreshed. His tribe is actually listed with Jeter, and it's assumed to have resided nearby and lived a nomadic, animal-herding lifestyle in sparsely populated land east of the Israelites. Now, what's interesting is Psalm 83 lists these as Hagarites separately from the other ten tribes which lived more southerly. So I'm not sure if that's true or not. It is interesting, however. So if you dig up the Hagarites, and they are the sons of Agar, they were associated with the Ishmaelites. And the inhabitants of the regions of Jeter, Naphish, and Nobdab, lying east of Gilead, they may have been related to the Hagarites, which means if it's from Hagarites, which name are you thinking of? Hagar. Yeah. They may have some relationship to Hagar, which is Ishmael's mother. Okay, that was all that boring information. Okay, uh, or fun, either or. I, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it myself. I enjoyed it myself. It was intensely interesting. Okay, now we can continue on in verse 16. We went through all their names. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles. Now, remember right here, verse 16, all those names are the sons of Ishmael. And it said right here that those specific 
names are one, their names, two, their towns, three, their castles. It was common that time that a person would uh, name a location after himself. That was common during uh, ancient times, as I've, as I've told you before in Genesis chapter uh, 10 and 11. Twelve princes according to their nations. Notice how this follows along the twelve tribes of Israel as well. Yeah. So it goes by twelve. And they are princes, yeah. and they go accordingly to their nations. So nations would be named, would follow along their names. Yeah. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, and 130 and seven years. So all the years that Ishmael lived in his life, he lived up to 137 years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. So Ishmael, the phrase gave up the ghost and died is that he passed away. So his spirit left him, that's the ghost. And then he was gathered to his people. Again, like I told you before, it could mean where he was... Uh, uh, the, his people buried him. That's why they gathered together. But more so, when we saw in Abraham's case, it's going to Abraham's bosom. So there may have been a chance that Ishmael is saved. However, in Esau's case, he is not. And we're going to see that later on. Uh, Ishmael had a better chance because of uh, his mother, Hagar, at that time. And they, uh, let's see, what was I going to go here? Uh, right here, verse 18. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur. Okay, that's the interesting part. So the Ishmaelites, I already drew the map here, and I showed you the northern part of Arabia, but it's really spread out to all of Arabia itself. Havilah, right? Now you notice there are two Havilahs I wrote there, which makes it confusing. They dwelt from Havilah to Shur. That is before Egypt. Now, most uh, people who draw the map will agree sure is around that terrain. Basically, it's right before Egypt, so we can agree that much. So that's northern Arabia. That would make a lot of sense. And the names of Ishmael's descendants match up with northern Arabia, right? So we can agree that much. But where is Havilah? If you keep reading down, it says, as thou goest toward Assyria. Okay, so sure is before Egypt. But then they said, from Havilah, as thou goest to Assyria. That means then, it will have to go like this. It will have to go this way. Because remember the trading, and then Israel's right there. And you might recall, Joseph's brothers had to sell him off as a slave. So this would make sense that the Ishmaelites were passing through in the southern part of Israel. If we were to continue reading on, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. The, that prophecy proved true. Go to Genesis 16. Genesis 16. Meaning that in the presence of Israel, of Isaac in this case, and his descendants, and Abraham's people, he did die in front of them. It did not mean that Ishmael was in Isaac's territory. Remember, they were in different territories. However, he was uh, nearby them. So, speaking in their presence. That's what it means. And that was what God promised Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. He promised her in verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Okay, go back to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. Why is Havilah down here? So we're going to have to explain this. Go to 1 Samuel 15. We got several issues. Go to Genesis 2 and 1 Samuel 15. Genesis 2. And 1 Samuel 15, did you forget about the location of the Garden of Eden? Havilah, remember that? This would also explain why the current modern sheiks and everybody, they have all that wealth. And that's where they get all that treasure. Why? Because it has a history, that location. Gold has a history in that location. It has to do with the Garden of Eden. So let's look at, first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 
Uh, we'll, we'll look at Genesis 2. That's better. Genesis 2. We'll look at verse 10. Verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. So a river goes out of Eden and parts into four heads. And majority of the maps is going to point out here. So it's going to turn into four. Now, I'm not drawing the four accurately, okay? But I've given a theory as well. The Garden of Eden could be somewhere, it could be a mountain because of the, there used to be waters, rivers that flow into Arabian territory. But uh, anyway, that's a whole other different teaching. If it's right there, then let's see Havilah. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Okay, and remember Havilah is where the Arabs are nearby, or actually living in it. Verse 13, the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. I've already explained what that meant, I'm not going to explain that part. The name of the third river is Hiddekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. See that? Toward the east of Assyria. Let's see here. And the fourth river is Euphrates. If you look up the current U Euphrates River, and people claim Hiddekel is Tigris, then around this territory would be correct. So Havilah, notice, would be somewhere around here. Right. Right. So that would be correct. Now, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. This part's weird. 1 Samuel 15, and then we'll look at verse 2. Verse 2, the Bible says, uh, no, not verse 2, verse 7, excuse me. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to shore that is over against Egypt. Wow, isn't that phrase pretty much word for word from Genesis 25? So Saul, remember, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin, you might recall, their southern tribe, Israel. See, they hit that location very well. So Saul was hitting the Amalekites in the southern part. And then it said, from Havilah to Shore. So it may be referring to that route. So not necessarily right here to here. It may be that route. But there's a simpler answer than that. Okay, you ready for this? Dr. Upman also said it could be referring to Yemen, but that's like really down here. So then what's the answer? I mean, you got Havilah, I don't think it's all the way here, you know. It's, it's somewhere here, but it says from Havilah to shore, as thou goest to Egypt. What does this mean? If you recall, in the previous verses I went to Genesis, when I talked about a certain location, it doesn't have to be, yes, all right, so... The black man is smart right over there. <laughs> You'll notice it's referring not to one, it's not refer, the borderline is not just a city. It's a whole territory. So if it's a whole territory, and remember people were spreading out that time. Why? Because one brother didn't want to live next door to his brother, all right? He wanted his own kingdom, all right? Uh, don't laugh, you all like that too. When you get old, you want to go away from mom and dad and then your siblings and Go to your own place and territory. So that's what happened. So if it's from here, Havilah, the Garden of Eden, it would make sense that it was spread out like this. If you give it also a thousand years, you're going to hit that much anyway. They're going to spread out. This is what I think makes the most logical sense. And that is proven several times in the Bible with certain locations and names. As a matter of fact, Arabia, it is possible that uh, if you study history, well, even in history, if you look at the Assyrian territory, right? It would go from there, and then uh, centuries later, it grows like this. Then it shrinks down, right? Persia was the same thing, and Arabia was definitely the same thing as well. I mean, even during the ADs, that happened. During the 80s, that happened. Look, a great example is Korea, okay? We were complete that time. Now it's split into two, no. two horrible parts. And then we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And then during World War II, there was no Korea. It was all Japan colonization. There was no Korea. So we didn't even exist that time. So that's just common sense in history. 
territories increase, decrease, or even disappear. Let's go back to Genesis 25. Now we've covered all of Ishmael's descendants. We just dedicated a whole video on Ishmaelites. I don't know if we're going to come to the next part. We'll see. So I hope you learned a lot. I don't know uh, a lot of commentaries that covered this much, actually. So if this has been great information and new to you, then awesome, awesome. Okay, let's look at verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. Now, now we're covering the generations of Isaac. The Holy Spirit wants to pay attention to Isaac now. He already covered his part with Ishmael, his promise with Ishmael. He gave credit, credence to whom, uh, and benefit to Ishmael. Where credit is due, he already did that. But the main importance now is Isaac. So let's switch attention, the Holy Spirit is saying. Right. I already covered my part with Ishmael. Now let's pay attention to Isaac, his generation. Isaac is Abraham's son, and Abraham, as we know, he gave birth, uh, he was able to have Isaac. Isaac was born from Abraham. Uh, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to, uh, Rebecca to wife, excuse me, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian. So Isaac, when he got married, believe it or not, he was 40 years old when he married Rebekah and took her as his wife. Rebekah, remember, is the daughter of Bethuel, who was located in Syria, and this was and of the location of Paddan Naram. She is also the sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. Okay, meaning Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. So he interceded, he was speaking for Rebekah when he was speaking to the Lord. Why? Because Rebekah had no children. She was barren. That's what it means. So barren means that she couldn't have children. She was empty. So the Lord was entreated from Isaac's request, and that's why Rebekah, his wife, was able to conceive, was able to bring forth a child. This is an example of intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayers are important. Why? New life could be born. That's how important it can be. So it is important to pray for other people. An example is 1 Timothy. I've given this before, but let's look at it again. 1 Timothy. Chapter 2. If you might recall that Abraham also did intercession for his nephew Lot. God knows what would have happened to Lot, maybe. God knows what would have happened to Lot if Abraham didn't intercede for Lot. Right. So that's why intercessory prayers are very important. Why? You could save a soul. You could save a life. You could create new life, as in Isaac's case. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication and prayer, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. So notice that when we pray to the Lord, it includes intercessions. Let's go to Genesis 25 again. Genesis 25 again. And we'll look at verse 22. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, okay, let me go over here now because i got to start writing notes over here. Am I cut off or no? Yes. Okay, am I cut off or no? no? All right then, so I'll go here. Is that okay? Nope. Okay, so here. <laughs> All right. Je Oh, I love, I love posting stuff online. Oh, my goodness. All right. We look at verse 22. Children. See, so not just one, uh, one baby inside her, but there's two. And they're struggling inside her, within her. They're struggling. So Rebecca asked, if it be so, why am I thus? She's saying... If I'm going to give birth, to, uh, if I have children inside me, why am I this way? What's going on right here? So she's trying to figure out what's going on. And she went to inquire of the Lord. So she prays to the Lord. Now notice everything right here, how Isaac and Rebekah lived, as a side note, was lived off by prayer. Their marriage was lived off by prayer. Remember, Isaac was meditating in the field. And then there was intercession in their prayer, and they were able to give birth to a child. They had every worry in the world because they were married late and they gave birth to children late as well because 
they didn't have children for 20 years. So let Isaac and Rebekah be an encouraging story to say believers here, because the Lord was able to bless Isaac where he actually lived long, and believe it or not, Rebekah was the one who died earlier, and she was the younger one, perhaps. Well, actually, she was definitely the younger one. So notice that Isaac was uh, blessed in his life just by following the Lord. Uh, let's keep reading here. So she inquires uh, of the Lord, meaning that she prayed to him. She wanted to find out what was going on. The Lord answers in verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Okay, so the Lord's saying that you're going to have two babies in your womb that are, gonna ha that are actually, actually going to be two nations. They're going to give birth to two different nations. Two manner of people, so two types, of, two groups of people, two different types of people, they're going to be separated from inside you. Bowels, remember, is referring to the empty innards. So that's why she has children inside her. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. So God's saying uh, one nation, one group of people from the child is going to be stronger than the other child and his group of people. Who is that? The elder shall serve the younger. So the elder is going to be the one that's going to serve the younger child. The younger child is going to be the one that comes off on top. And notice that verse 23 keeps reading, And God was a Calvinist and damned the elder son and said, I hated him ever since he was born. And even though he didn't make any good or evil choice, I hated him since. Is that what it said? No, I totally made that up. You know what Calvinism, it, Calvinism is? Totally made up stuff. Yeah. So their passage is Romans 9. Go to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. They don't teach that. Yeah, they teach that. They use Romans 9 to teach that. So look at Romans 9. The reason why they teach that is because they claim that before people were ever born, God elected, meaning he chose certain people to be saved and go to heaven. Well, that's rotten. That means then the rest of the people are elected to be damned for hell. That's what it means. Now, more, some Calvinists are more honest. I think they're called hyper-Calvinists. And some of them are more honest where, they'll, where, where they will say, well, let's just be honest. That means God elected people for damnation too. All right? So that's what it means. But anyway, both hyper-Calvinists and uh, normal Calvinists, they will use Romans 9. Romans 9, and then verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, that's what we can agree with that matched in Genesis, yes? yes? Okay, so this passage is in Genesis 25. Before Esau and Jacob uh, were ever born, they, uh, it was pronounced the elder will serve the younger, correct? Right. And they didn't do any good or evil, the elder will serve the younger. Okay, we can agree with all that. Where did you get the idea about, I hated Esau ever since? No, it never said that. I'll tell you where God said, I hated Esau. He said that almost a thousand years later, Malachi 1. So this is after they did evil. And that's the reason why God hates Esau. Okay, so why are they mingling that with all the way here? Where before they even did any good or evil. No, because they did evil, God hated Esau. Go to Malachi 1. Malachi 1. This is where the hatred started. The hatred started because of their evil deeds. Not before they were born, where they didn't even do any good or evil. Imagine, what kind of father, before the baby's even born, would go, I hate that baby, even if the baby didn't do anything wrong. You call your heavenly father that way? Not even, uh, 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 man, that is just so messed up. Not even a diehard unbeliever would go for something like that. Right. Only a Christian who's educated in seminaries. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. 
who majors in Hebrew and Greek. Okay, now let's go to Malachi 1. Now keep your hand on Romans 9, because I'm going to show you where they uh, goofed up, all right? So let's go to Malachi 1. Notice this is almost a thousand years after Genesis 25, all right? Esau was long dead, okay? So Esau couldn't even do this. So who was it? It's referring to his nation. His nation. Look at Malachi 1. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. So notice right here why God hates Esau. This was almost a thousand years later. Now go to Obadiah. Obadiah is a whole prophecy dedicated on Esau. But notice Esau was long dead. So what is Esau referring to? A nation. It's like Jacob. I love Jacob, right? Jacob's name is Israel. So when God says, I love Israel, does he, is he only referring to Israel, you know, all, only in Genesis 25? Or is he referring to even now, yeah. Israel? Yeah. Or Israel, the descendants later on, the nation? Look at uh, Obadiah. Notice in verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord concerning Edom. See, that's Esau. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art what? Greatly despised. Why? The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. So it's because of their sin. So this matches well. Okay, well, that, that, that's easy to understand. Why is this so complicated? I'll tell you what makes it complicated. Go to Romans 9. Go to Romans 9. Now notice right here, verse 13, right? Verse 13. Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Don't we agree with that? Yeah, we can agree with that. We agree that happened right here. Not here, okay? Not before birth. That's a cruel God. Not before birth. Before birth is elder shall serve the younger. The hatred is because of their evil deeds almost a thousand years later. Well, then what's the big deal here? Why do they mingle that all the way here? You know why? Exegesis, exegesis, says the scholar. So, improper exegesis, you can't ignore right here in verse 10, 11, 12, 13 is combined together to make proper exegesis. That's why some Calvinist scholars, and believe it or not, they act like jerk because they think they got a degree from seminary. I, I despise that. I have total disrespect for that. All right. I believe that any man, woman, or child, educated or uneducated, it doesn't matter who you are, they can know that book, and you don't need Professor Fluffy Fluff tell you what to do. So then when you look at these guys in their debates, they just sound so very arrogant. And then they'll say, no, you, uh, when we do a debate, only Romans 9 has the debate. Don't go to any other verse. You know why? Because they know that their argument falls apart. So then we're going to stick to Romans 9. You want to stick to Romans 9? I'll prove them, them wrong in their game then, yeah. in proper exegesis. So exegesis meaning that context of the text, right. Right? right? So let's look at proper context. If we go by proper context here, this is my argument. My argument is this. Proper exegesis is not 10 through 13. That's so small, your exegesis. You know what the exegesis is? The entire chapter, Romans 9. I thought that's the debate. Isn't the debate Romans 9? Mr. Jimmy White's got to change the title to debate only on Romans 9, 10 to 13. Not Romans 9. He'd lose. You know why? Because Romans 9, look at the whole context. The whole context, verse 1 through 5, is about Jews, right? Jews that they are the elect of God. But then in verse 6, 7, and 8, the Jews who received the election, what God did was he took away 
that spiritual blessing, uh, that spiritual election from them, and then he said, I'm going to switch from one nation to another nation, yeah. from six to eight, right? right? He's saying the ones that are counted as the elect are the children of the promise, verse eight, right? Yeah. So that's the main argument here. Okay, so here's the thesis. The thesis is not verse, uh, what, they, what they call it? Verse 11. They love verse 11. That ain't your thesis. Yeah. That's part of the argument. Yeah. Okay, what's the thesis? Verse 8, the children of the promise. So what God promised, what God chose. Hence, it's called elect. It's that simple. Yeah. That's why it's called elect. Because what God decides to choose. Because he can decide to choose whoever he wants. Amen. So then, here are these Jews who are so jealous that the Gentiles partake in it. And this is proven when you look at verses uh, 24 through 33. 24 through 33, the conclusion yeah. is about God where he uh, rejected the Jewish people and then he elected the Gentiles. That's what he did. He switched. So even though Israel has the physical promises in the election, they don't have the spiritual. So he switched it to the Gentiles. Uh, let's see right here. Jew to Gentile. And this is proven in introduction and conclusion. You notice that? Yeah. The first verses and the last verses. That's your intro and conclusion. It's not verses uh, 9 through uh, 11 or something like that, okay? Why do you limit that? You don't know the full picture. Look at that. I thought you're for exegesis. Isn't that very limited exegesis? Notice, it, notice I'm giving you true exegesis. True exegesis. We're going to look at a fuller context here. Now, if the idea is about this is the thesis, what God promised, what he chose... Look at this, verse 9, isn't that separated? For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Isn't that one? And then two is verses 10 through 12. And then three is uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Then another one is Moses and Pharaoh, verse 15. And then 17, and then another one, verses... Uh, 17 through 20. Here's the point. You know what the point is? Notice he's giving several different arguments to support the thesis. He's not mingling all of them together. He's not mingling all of that together. If you want to mingle all of that together, you got crummy exegesis. You want, then you have to be honest and mingle up Pharaoh with Rebekah and Sarah with Jacob and Esau. No, they're all separated as an argument. Oh, I'm having so much fun debunking yeah. this. Okay. All right. So notice verse 9 is separate. Sarah. Verse 10 through 12. Yep, 12. Separated. That's referring to the birth, right? And service. Then we look at uh, verse 13. 13 is where he mentions the hatred. And then I could go on and on and on. Verse 14, etc., etc. All these different arguments. Now, what they're going to assume is this, okay? They're going to assume, well, because verse 13 says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, loved Esau have I hated, that's referring to the context of verse 11 and 12, as it is written. No, when the Bible says, as it is written, okay, the author, he's going to use a verse to support his thesis. So when the author gives a thesis or a statement, he's going to give a supporting verse. Now, this is what I argue. What I argue is, when he's quoting verse 13, as it is written, it's not supporting 10 and 11. It's supporting verse 8. You know why? Because that's the thesis. That's the statement. This ain't the statement. That's the statement. So verse 13 is 
as it is written, he's using scriptural support for this. Yes. Notice you can go back a couple verses. It's not the immediate verse. Amateurs do immediate verse, and that's not proper exegesis. Right. You, you want to bet? I'll, yeah, let's play a game. Acts 7 and Acts 13. Let's play a game. Acts 7, Acts 13. You want to bet? I'll bet you. Yeah. Let's, let's go by immediate. The, let's claim that the verse, as it is written, is supposed to explain the previous verse behind it. If that's what it works, then it ain't going to make sense. Right. Go to Acts chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 42, verse 42. And then Acts 13, and then we'll call it a day. Acts 7 and Acts 13. Then I'll call it a day. Acts chapter 7, verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. So God uh, forsook the Jews and let them worship the pagan gods. As it is written in the book of the prophets... O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Um, so notice right here, uh, let's go to the immediate context. So as it is written is what? As it is written is the Jews offered animal sacrifices to the Lord 40 years in the wilderness, right? Okay, let's look at the previous verse. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoice in the works of their own hands. So is verse 42 talking about when they made sacrifices to God out in the wilderness, that was referring to the idol? No, it's referring, believe it or not, the verse after it. So when it says, as it is written, it doesn't have to explain the verse behind it. It can go in front of it. Right. Look at verse 43. Yeah. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rempham. Yada, yada, yada. All right, let's go to Acts 13. Here's a better one. Go to Acts 13. Here's a big goodie. And look at verse 33. If you claim that when God gives a verse, as it is written and then the verse is given, that that is supposed to explain away the previous sentence, you don't know proper exegesis. Because that previous statement before as it is written could be part of a larger exegesis. Was that too deep for you Calvinist scholars, you? All right, let's look at Acts chapter 13. Look at verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. So if God resurrected Jesus Christ, what's the scriptural proof? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. What? Notice right here that when God uh, had his son born, begotten, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense that it supports the previous statement, God resurrected Jesus. But I'll tell you who makes that mistake, a cult by Garner Ted Armstrong. Because they made the same Calvinist boo-boo. When the verses as it is written, it's supposed to support and explain away the previous statement. So because they have that Calvinist logic, they're saying right here that when God uh, begotten Jesus Christ, it happened at his resurrection, they claim. But that's taught by Garner Ted Armstrong. No, that's not what it is. Because verse 34 explains to you, and as concerning that he raised up from the dead, now no more to return corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Look at that. So notice right here concerning the resurrection, he's continuing to explain at 34, 35, 36. Then what is this day that I begotten? It's not the previous sentence. It's referring, if you go back to, uh, let's see here. If you look at verse uh, 26 and 32, 26, 32, what's that about? It's talking about Jesus Christ, the promise that he would be sent to this earth. Yes. That's what that as it is written statement is referring to. Notice you can go a couple verses back. You notice that? Yep. You can go a couple verses back. And the as it is written statement can go a couple verses back or even in front. What's the point? The point is it's an amateur unscholastic, if that's even a word, 
unintelligent mindset, you don't deserve to be a seminary scholar or a theologian or an interpreter of Hebrew and Greek right. if you have a limited amateur thinking that when the Bible says as it is written, that verse is only referring to the previous sentence before it. No, that's a limited exegesis, and that's not even a full exegesis. That's only a part. Look at this, 10 through 12. Come on, man. Yeah. Go to Romans 9. So you have to look at the entire yeah. context. Notice that in verse 13, Jacob, have I loved, Esau have I hated, that when it says, as it is written, why would God hate that? Because we go back a couple verses. Verse 8 is the thesis right there. Verse 8 is the thesis. As a matter of fact, you can jump verses ahead. If you go to the conclusion part, it explains why. Because the Jews chose not to believe, but the Gentiles believed. Right. That's the reason why God's hatred was on them. And for some of you who don't know, I know I went over time, but let me just close it with this. For some of you who didn't know, that's the reason why if you are not saved in Jesus Christ, God's hatred is on you. The only, uh, his love is found at Calvary. Yeah. He loved the whole world that he died for you on the cross. Yeah. But see, that's where you can only find his love, at the cross. Yeah. If you go outside of the cross, it's nothing but the hatred and wrath of God, which is why God can let a soul burn in hell forever. Yeah. Why? Because his hatred will be eternal. That's the reason why it's important to have his eternal love instead. He doesn't go eternal love, partial hatred. Or eternal hatred, partial love. He is complete and eternal in all of his attributes. Amen. Okay, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has uh, been a blessing to the hearers, increased our knowledge of the scriptures, and opened our eyes to right doctrine. Yes. And understanding every word from that precious book, in Jesus' name we pray.